Got a license to kill, but not with a gun. Got a license to kill, not with a gun. We'll spray them like bugs. We have nowhere to run. We're gonna dump tons of poisons out into the air. Aluminium strutting and burying. Trying to stop us if you dare. It'll kill off the plants, the birds and the bees. And happen so slowly. No one will see. What role do you see ethical standards playing in nanotechnology and, and what do you see as the key sort of safety issues to keep this very powerful technology safe? Out Looking of the bag. at terrorism, I think the first thing to observe is this is a very sophisticated technology that will be in the hands of governments, uh, corporations, uh, long before it's in the hands of, of, uh, of, of people who are, are in smaller groups and are uh, outside the, 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 the sphere of, of open uh, technology development and activity. At some point, though, powerful technologies, as we've seen, become, tend to diffuse, tend to become widely available. And there are often things that can be done with them that one very much wants to suppress. And I think that if we look at the future, where technologies are going, even without nanotechnology, just with Moore's law progress, we're seeing a greater and greater density of sensors and communication systems. I think that the concern that people should have downstream a decade or two isn't that there will be terrorists uh, doing things that threaten them but rather that systems that have been put in place to, among other things, suppress terrorism will have succeeded and may be used to suppress things that they would prefer not be, to not be suppressed. So people have been saying that terrorism will be a long open-ended war. If you look at this from the perspective, perspective of technology, I think that even without nanotechnology, that we're moving toward a world of intensive network surveillance systems that will be able to suppress whatever people want to suppress. Uh, terrorism is very much a passing problem and that our concerns should be focused on how to manage the technologies that will make terrorism no longer be a problem. Uh, how to deal with the world in which there is that degree of ability uh, to observe what people are doing and to control human action. The Resilient Ridge is a direct result of, again, global network of ionosphere heaters like HARP, like the HARP facility in Alaska. These installations can and are creating massive high-pressure zones. When the massively powerful radio frequency microwave transmissions, millions of watts, are focused on regions of the upper atmosphere, specifically the ionosphere, the transmissions cause an electrical chain reaction in the ionosphere, which radically heats that layer. The expanding bubble of heated atmosphere pushes up and down. The downward push is the creation of the high-pressure dome. This is not speculation. The U.S. military has long since admitted to the existence of such facilities. The stated purpose of heating the atmosphere and creating the expanding regions I just covered is this, to create resistance to a potential incoming ICBM, intercontinental ballistic missile, and thus to reportedly defend against it, but the blatantly obvious climate modification use is never mentioned. What else do the high pressure zones allow the weather makers to do? These zones allow them to steer the upper level wind currents, the jet stream. Why would they want to do that, many ask? The upper level winds are the key to steering and controlling the weather. That's exactly what they're doing. Back to the ridiculously resilient ridge in California. This ionosphere heater induced high pressure dome spins clockwise in the atmosphere like a giant gear in the climate system. The jet stream must spin around it, up and over it, and then back down in the lower 48 states further to the east of the fried and dried west coast. This creates a massive dip in the jet stream. Welcome to the recently named polar vortex. This is how this is constructed. The climate science communities make up the terms as they go in order to cover the tracks of the climate engineers and to give legitimacy to the newly created scenarios that are directly related to climate engineering. 
By the way, this includes the naming of about a dozen and a half new clouds that apparently never existed before. When you give a name to the cloud, like Undulatus apparatus, sounds very official, sounds very natural and scientific, even though it's a result of climate engineering. The population accepts that and thus is all too happy to stay in their denial, not noticing the otherworldly skies above their heads every day with jet aircraft spewing toxic aerosols into the sky to modify the climate. Now to connect all that I've just described to so-called winter storm Benji, which was just engineered to bring a small shot of patented chemically ice nucleated snow to the most populated regions of the U.S. and the East Coast. This snow is created with moisture drawn straight from the record warm waters of the Gulf of Mexico. How does that work out exactly? Here's how. The jet stream spins clockwise, as I stated. In, in the western U.S., jet stream goes up and around that rotates it back downward around a counterclockwise rotating low pressure zone again high and low pressure zones created with ionosphere heaters and aerosol operations this low pressure zone spins counterclockwise so picture a fan on the front of a car with a fan belt spinning around various wheels and that's exactly what you have happening with the jet stream spinning up and over the high pressure in the west back down spinning counterclockwise around the low pressure like a gear with a fan belt around it that low pressure picks up moisture from the Gulf of Mexico, and that moisture is then streamed up through the southeast along.